I have done two other messages on this um, in in the past, uh, and uh, initially this was going to be um, a separate message to that. But as the more I, I sort of got into it, the more I realised it actually should be part of that series. Um, so I do have actually have the first two up on our YouTube channel already. Uh, the first one is on um, uh, it was history of the church, but it was uh, I looked at traditions. I don't know if you remember this one or not. Um, and what I had looked at, uh, I looked at the birth of Jesus uh, and the traditions that had come um, and have been sort of wrapped around Christmas. And uh, you know, we, we've got a whole bunch of different kinds of um, traditions that we we assume. Uh, uh, Christian traditions and and what we did is we saw a lot of them were actually based upon uh, pagan traditions and uh, tr- pagan rituals things like that. Um, you know, one, one of the the biggest I guess misunderstandings or misconceptions of um, our Christmas tradition is that Jesus was born on the twenty fifth of December. And I showed you if you remember. Look, I know I'm going back a fair while because I think I did this message last year sometime. But uh, we we saw that Jesus actually was born on September eleventh, around about three BC. Um, it's a little bit hard to know exactly what year it was, but we know that it was around that time. Uh, we celebrate on the 25th of December because at one stage it was the, the pagan solstice festival. Um, and as as many of us know, what the Catholic Church did when... You know, when it started to take uh, precedence over over pagan religions, particularly when the Catholic Church became the state religion uh, in the Roman Empire, um, we saw that a lot of the the traditions that were under the Roman and pagan uh, traditions actually were just um, rebranded, renamed, um, and you know, given a Christian facade. Now, I have no trouble with that, by the way. Um, you know, I have no issues with the fact that um, you know there are many pagan traditions, pagan. Um, uh, you know, festivals, blah, 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 that that have been given this Christian veneer. I have no issues because they have the Christian veneer. You know, like, sure, we know that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, but but if, as a whole, the entire planet, um, or at least the entire Western world, is celebrating the birth of Jesus on a particular day. Um, and as long as his name is being talked about and mentioned, that's, I'm happy with that, you know, so I have no issues with that. Um, a whole bunch of other things, you know, um, there were... Uh, you know, a lot of pagan traditions regarding uh, Easter and, and Jesus' crucifixion. Um, we saw why uh, Easter is celebrated at different times of the year. We saw that actually that was uh, as a result of anti-Semitism. Um, and uh, one of the, the uh, ecumenical councils that occurred um, way back in time, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, by the way, some of that kind of stuff, um, you know, decided that they didn't want to have, um, you know, uh, the birth of Jesus celebrated on the same day that um, the Jews celebrated their Passover. So, so it's sort of a whole calculation with the way the moon works, um, and that was purely because of anti-Semitism. Uh, and we saw uh, that many of the uh, things we celebrate at, at uh, Easter time, um, like Lent, Easter eggs, um, and uh, I didn't go too far into this, but but uh, the story of Nimrod is a really interesting thing because traditionally the story of Nimrod uh, mirrors almost exactly the story of Jesus' um, life and death um, and crucifixion, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we saw all that kind of stuff. Then um, part two was uh, basically the history of the church. It was a, was a very abbreviated history starting from uh, the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection, went all the way up to essentially modern times. Um, you know, we looked at Peter and how the Catholic Church sort of views Peter as the the head of the church. I did mention this in my la- one of my previous messages about you know Jesus saying, calling Peter the rock, and on this church, on this rock, I'll build my church. And we saw that actually that wasn't what Jesus was actually saying. Um, anyway, so we looked at it from uh, Peter. Uh, we looked briefly at the early church fathers. Um, and, and the other, other thing we saw, which was really amazing, is how soon after Jesus' death and resurrection that man-made traditions and doctrines and things came into being in the church. Um, and so, again, I'm, I'm going to be looking at, the, at those kind of things today in more depth. In particular, I'm going to be looking at the church fathers um, and seeing their influence on the modern church as well. Um, and so this message today is um, the church fathers and how they influenced the modern church. Now, it's really important, I believe, to, to learn from history. I think we're going through a period of history right now. You know, you've heard, you've heard that saying, uh, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. And, and we are, in a lot of respects, um, going through that right now. You know, we've seen things, even in our more, I guess, 
modern history, uh, you know, in the 20th century and particularly um, things that happened in Europe um, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, was, you know, we're seeing very, very similar um, things happening in our own country here in, in Australia and also in, in Europe and in the US. Uh, just with regards to, to certain rights being taken away and things like that and state control, um, government control being, uh, you know, um, I guess forced upon us. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of think a lot of people that are that are cheering that kind of stuff have failed to learn from history. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to go as bad as what it did. You know, I don't... I think in that respect, I think, um, I think we in the West in particular have learnt Definitely the lessons of, of the past in that scenario, but certainly when it comes to things like um, you know certain liberties and things like that, I, I you know I feel like we are um, you know going in that sort of direction. Um, but you know, like I said, I don't I don't believe in any sense of the word that we will ever get as bad as what that was in the past. But you know, we've got to learn from the past, and and I think one of the things that that um, Nerida and I, and I say this a lot, that one of the, the greatest revelations that God ever gave us when we started our church was to never be afraid to ask the question, why? Um, you know, why do we do the things that we do? And and essentially that uh, that revelation was a catalyst for us being where we are today. It, you know, it caused us to, to not just accept what we we're reading in Scripture and not just accept what we were hearing from the pulpit, but to actually... You know, pull it apart. Look at where it's coming from. Look at the roots of it. Look at where you know where it came from, um, and that's what Nerida will be doing in her series on Job. You know, she'll be pulling it apart, uh, looking at the history of things, so that we can get a context of what's going on. And I think it's really important that we in the church um, have a, a, a you know an understanding of the context of. of why we believe the things that we do, why the church teaches the things that it teaches, um, and where they came from. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, so the church as we know it today is the result of thousands of years of teaching, beliefs, doctrines and traditions. Um, and it's interesting that, that uh, m- you know, many of the doctrines and traditions from 2,000 years ago still are around today in, in many forms, many functions. Um, so we're going to be looking at where they came from. Um, you know, there have been many, many great women and men um, of God who have taught through the last 2,000 years. They've laid this foundation uh, of the modern church. They've built this giant you know, sort of edifice. I mean, it is. It's a, it's a huge, giant edifice, the church. Um, and the church has changed millions of lives throughout history. Um, but, you know, as we all, all know, it has not been without its controversies. It hasn't been without its false and, and um, misunderstood doctrines. And, and certainly we know, even just reading scripture about the flawed characters. Um, and, you know, there is this uh, perception, I guess, that the the early church fathers were these these perfect kind of beings, and and that's kind of what what the the Catholic Church has made a lot of them to into. You know, they become saints. Um, you know, and, and within the Catholic Church in particular, those these uh, these characters that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, talking about today, that we will see were, were pretty flawed characters, um, and now venerated as being these saints. And people actually pray to these these um, these people. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, some of them are patron saints of certain things, like you know. Um, patron saints of uh, I was reading the other day there's one I, I can't remember which church father it was because I, I I didn't want to write down what it was because I thought it was so ridiculous but one of the church fathers I'm talking about today actually is the patron saint of brewers which you know is interesting for me um, because I'm such a big fan of craft beer in particular um, but yeah it's, it's interesting the way that the these these extremely flawed characters have been turned into these venerated figures um so what we're going to do, as I said, we're going to start right at the beginning and talk about these early church fathers, who they were, what they taught, and how their influence still resonates today. And um, and then we'll look at some of the more recent teachers and what their influences are on the on the modern church. And I think most of the names you're going to be familiar with, I think it's important that we understand, though, uh, where they stood in their beliefs, how much influence they had on the church, uh, and whether it was good and bad. And we will see today that there were some influences from some of the people that have been venerated actually were bad influences on on the church and in particular doctrines. Um, now, it's important to understand, I think so many people get lost when they're reading scripture um, in in the timelines of things. I, I spoke about this last time. Uh, you know, having an understanding of the timeline of what's going in is so important. Um, you know, we know that Jesus' death, uh, his life, his death, his resurrection all occurred in a very short period of time, really, in a specific time and place. Um, so his ministry really only lasted three years, um, and he died at around about the age of 33 years old. 
Um, now, I vaguely remember being 33. It was way back in the um, the last century. But, um, yeah, you know, I just think we just lose, lose track of these timelines. Um, you know, the people that, that he surrounded himself with, uh, you know, his disciples and, and all that kind of stuff, they were all um, all very flawed characters. Um, but they were also influential in, in this new religion called Christianity. Um, but we won't be looking at their writings today. We have looked at them in the past. Um, so, um, you know, look, their writings um, are obviously vitally important um, in, in forming our doctrines and our beliefs. But, but what I'm going to be doing today is looking at those who came after those guys. Um, now, John, uh, I have spoken about John in the past um, we're going to be starting with uh, the church fathers um, who who um, came after John. Um, John was essentially um, the last apostle. He was the end of the apostolic age, as they call it. Um, and he died around 100 AD. Um, he was the last disciple who lived, walked, talked, ate and breathed with Jesus. Um, all of the other disciples up to that point um, had been um, martyred. Um, either by the Jewish leaders, by the Romans, um, or some of them were actually uh, martyred by um, those who they were ministering to. Um, I think one of the disciples, Thomas, maybe, um, preached in, in India and actually was actually killed by um, um, the pagans in India. So it's really interesting if you ever get the chance to to look at the history of what happened with the disciples. It's actually quite an interesting story. Uh, you know, we sort of think that. Uh, you know, they all just sort of concentrated on that, that sort of small area in Jerusalem, but they actually did travel um, all around the known world. You know, I mean, as we know, the Roman Empire uh, stretched all the way to Britain and, um, you know, all the way over um, towards the edges of India and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and those other places existed too, you know, we, we, we go, you know, I think we, you know, if we are just concentrating on biblical history, we just, you know, everything sort of within that sort of the Levant area and possibly up around Rome. But, you know, the, the world was still huge then. Um, and so the disciples did travel, um, you know, to all the edges of the known world and, and all of them except John um, died in the, in the pursuance of, of their ministry. Uh, now, John died of natural causes. He was the only uh, disciple to die of natural causes. He lived, was living in the city of Ephesus. He had been exiled to Patmos. Um, while in Patmos, um, he was actually, so Tertullian, uh, one of the, the early church fathers, wrote uh, that he was thrown into a vat of boiling oil um, by the Romans to kill him. And uh, the story is that he survived. He you know, um, wasn't burnt or hurt by the the. Uh, the boiling oil, and as a result, the people that came to watch this this um, execution, um, all of them apparently were all saved. Um, now I don't I don't know whether that uh, that happened or not. There's not a lot of evidence to say whether it did or not. Um, you know, I guess though, if we're going to believe the writings of the early church fathers, then we need to understand that. Well, if Tertullian said that, then you know, more than likely it was true. He was uh, writing two centuries later, but but um, you know, as we'll see, um, the, the, these people's lives overlapped. Um, and so even though it was um, two, 200 years later, um, you know, it would have been recounted to him by people that knew people that knew John. So, you know, uh, you sometimes got to take things with a grain of salt, but also you've got to understand um, that, you know, like we're, we're not talking about Chinese whispers here. We are talking about people with good authority that say these things. Okay, so John had a number of disciples. Um, like I was saying before that there were... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church has a lot of history, a lot of traditions around the disciples and the apostles. Um, one of the things that they believe, actually, is that um, with the death of John, that the, um, the period of public revelation from Jesus came to an end. Um, now, you could say that insofar as, um, you know, uh, obviously Jesus was, was, uh, had ascended into heaven, so he was no longer on the earth, so we couldn't hear his actual words from, from, from his mouth. Um, John uh, was the last person alive to actually be able to recount the actual words that came out of Jesus' mouth. But we do know that the Holy Spirit still is, is teaching us things today. Um, but that's what the Catholic Church believes, that, that um, you know, the public uh, revelation period ended when John died. Uh, they believe that everything Jesus intended to convey had been conveyed. Um, now, John lived long enough to have several of his own disciples. Um, and two of these, Polycarp and Ignatius, became very influential in the early church. And uh, along with Clement of Rome, uh, and I won't be talking about Clement today, uh, they were classed as the, um, or the, as church fathers, they were known as the apostolic fathers. And the apostolic fathers were those that sort of taught around about um, the period between 95 AD and 150 AD. Okay, so who was Ignatius? 
Ignatius was born in 35 AD, and that was only a short time after Jesus' death and resurrection. So, uh, so they reckon that Jesus died uh, and ascended into heaven around about 30 AD, possibly 33 AD, depending on which time frame you believe. Um, so Ignatius was born around about the time that Jesus died and ascended into heaven. Now, the interesting thing um, about Ignatius in particular is Ignatius uh, grew up with people that, you know, apart from John, that would have, um, you know, possibly heard Jesus speak, would have seen him, would have walked with him. Um, so, so you know, uh, you know, my, my dad will tell me stories about his time, um, you know, playing for um, Kensington um, and then playing one game for Souths. Uh, so my dad almost played for South Sydney. Um, and funny, a funny story, um, sidetracking here, but um, he, uh, him and another player from his team um, had just finished playing a game and a taxi pulls up and one of the officials from the South Sydney team runs over and says, I need two players. Um, we've got we've lost two players. We need them immediately. So dad and another guy called Kevin Longbottom jumped in this cab, went, uh, dad played 20 minutes, Kevin played 20 minutes, Kevin got the gig and ended up being South, one of South Sydney's best ever players. Anyway, um, so but Dad tells me stories about those kind of things. He he tells me stories about um, some of the older players um, that no longer are alive and and you know things that he talked about with them. Um, but I know them to be true because my dad was there and 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 talked about it. I will then tell my children about it, um, and the, you know, and then they'll tell their children. Um, you know, it doesn't take away the validity of what that person said because we're hearing eyewitness accounts. And so Ignatius would have been like that. He would have heard um, eyewitness accounts from people. He might have even had people in his own family that, that saw Jesus and heard Jesus speak. Um, little is known of his time uh, with John. Um, not much historical stuff was written. Um, but according to Eusebius, and we'll be talking about Eusebius later on, uh, he was um, uh, appointed bishop of the Church of Antioch. Um, by the Apostle Peter himself in 66 AD. Uh, Ignatius visited his old friend Polycarp in Smyrna, and we'll talk about Polycarp in a second. Uh, and while he was in, in Smyrna, um, Ignatius wrote a series of epistles to the churches in Ephesus, Magnesia, Trellis, and then later to the churches in Rome, Philadelphia, Smyrna, and also letters to his old friend Polycarp. Um, Ignatius's main um, teaching was about obeying the church leadership, avoiding heresies and keeping the faith. It's important to understand, um, and I have spoken of this before, and particularly in that uh, message on um, the timeline of the church history, um, there was a lot of um, bad doctrine going around at that time. Um, not just from you know the pagan churches and, and the Gnostic churches, things like that, but there was a lot of really, really bad doctrine going on in the, in the Christian churches. Uh, and we know that that uh, you know Paul wrote a lot of letters to those churches. He did write letters to the same a lot of the same churches, Ephesus um, and Rome, um, where you know bad doctrine was being mixed in and stuff was being taken from Gnosticism and from other religions, all that kind of stuff, and sort of melted into the whole Christian thing. I uh, got to remember, um, you know, around this time, say sixty six AD, Christianity was still a brand new religion. Um, and, uh, and actually, um, up until probably around about maybe 30 years before then, no, maybe even uh, 15 years before then, um, a lot of the members of the church were purely Jewish. So, you know, only um, the church had only had uh, non-Jewish or Gentile believers in there for a short time. So it's, it's, it's quite understandable that, you know, a lot of, lot of, bad doctrine would come in. The other issue, of course, was that um, people were being placed into leadership that had, you know, uh, had been taught bad doctrine, so they were just continuing that. And, you know, what's really sad is that hasn't changed. It's still happening today where people have been taught under bad doctrine, they become leaders, and then their bad doctrine continues. Um, Ignatius's letters reveal that um, at the time the church was struggling with pagan and Gnostic influences and Gnosticism in particular was a huge issue with the church um, for the first few centuries, as we'll see later on. Um, the other issue, of course, was the Judaizers um, who were trying to mix the law with Jesus' teaching. Uh, again, we see that. Um, that was something that, that Paul wrote a lot about. Um, you know, that was something that we saw that Peter got involved in. You know, he was um, still mixing with the Judaizers. Uh, and Paul had to publicly rebu rebuke Peter at one point because he was mixing uh, with the Judaizers. And a lot of scripture that we read, uh, particularly stuff from Paul and even the words of Jesus, uh, address this issue of trying to mix law with grace, trying to mix, um, you know, uh, the Mosaic law and that teaching with, with, um, with uh, Jesus' teaching. 
Ignatius was the first person to use the word Christianity in his writings as well. Um, his teachings and writings set up the beginning of the modern church theology, um, such as the threefold characters in the Trinity. Um, he also, though, taught on the Catholic theology, like holiness and unity in the church, um, the hierarchy of church leadership and the primacy of the see, or the like the, the Pope in Rome, the Holy See. Um, you know, we saw that the, the Catholic Church um, believed that, um, you know, when Jesus said to Peter that he would build the church, that Peter was the first Pope. Um, and so this whole veneration of, of um, people um, in leadership started uh, from around this time, and Ignatius was one of the ones that actually contributed to that. Um, and Ignatius was uh, martyred in Rome in 110 AD. Polycarp was another one of um, um, John's disciples, and more than likely the most famous one as well, um, and one of the most influential too. Polycarp was born around 60 AD, so he was slightly um, older than Ignatius. Uh, again, only a short time... Oh, no, no, sorry, Pol Ignatius was 35, wasn't he? He started um, he ministering at 66. Yeah, sorry. No, Polycarp was younger. Um, anyway, he, uh, he was born around 60 AD, ran about 25 to 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Same deal. He, apart from the fact that he, he lived and walked and talked with John, he also probably would have um, known other people that walked and talked with Jesus as well. Uh, Polycarp becomes a bishop of the church in Smyrna in Asia Minor, it's uh, around about Turkey, during the first half of the second century. Uh, Polycarp taught on the miracles and teachings of Jesus, as handed down directly from John, uh, who had witnessed these events firsthand. So again, we can be sure that Polycarp was teaching the truth. Polycarp is well taught against Gnosticism, uh, and I have spoken about Gnosticism many times before. Um, Gnosticism was prevalent in the church at that time, um, and again, um, many of the letters in the New Testament were written specifically to address Gnosticism. Uh, Polycarp wrote several letters uh, or epistles, um, but the only one to survive actually was written to the church in Philippi, and that consisted of 14 short chapters. And in this epistle, he wrote about loving each other, living in harmony, having patience and perseverance, and all of these things were similar to what Paul wrote in his epistles as well. Um, this is interesting, though. He, he quoted from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as from Paul's letters. He quoted from John's Gospel. He quoted from um, First Peter. And as a result, um, this gives uh, those writings both historical and canonical importance. Um, you know, one of the funny things I hear from, from people all the time, in particular atheists, um, is that, you know, the Bible was written, uh, you know, four or five centuries later by the Catholic Church. But, but you know, like writings from Polycarp exist uh, from only, you know, like, say, 40, 50 years after those particular um, letters and epistles were written. So um, so we can know, um, you know, quite confidently that if he's quoting these passages from these books um, that were in the, the, the New Testament canon, then we can know pretty, um, pretty sure that they actually are the genuine article. Uh, Polycarp was one of the earliest Christians whose writings have survived to this day as well. Um, now, his, his uh, writings can be dated as well, so again, that adds validity to the, um, the fact that the, the, uh, you know, these biblical books that he quoted actually were the real deal. Um, so if anyone ever says to you that, these, that the scriptures were written you know, hundreds of years later, you can just point to Polycarp and say, no, they weren't. Uh, Polycarp also had a number of disciples. It's interesting the way that this works. Um, one of these disciples, Irenaeus, would also become known as one of the church's most influential figures. Um, and Polycarp was martyred around about 160 AD. So Polycarp's um, disciple, Irenaeus uh, of Lyon, was born around 130 AD and grew up in Asia Minor. So again, that's around the Turkey area, under the ministry of Polycarp in Smyrna. Uh, Irenaeus was deeply influenced by Polycarp's teachings and hearing the accounts of Jesus' life that Polycarp heard from John, who, if you remember, had walked with Jesus. Irenaeus was also heavily influenced in Rome by the teachings of Justin Martyr, and we'll talk about him a bit later. Uh, and Justin Martyr ministered against Gnosticism and Docetism. Now, um, Docetism is very similar to Gnosticism. Docetism, though, um, believes that Jesus only appeared to have had a physical body and it was really a spiritual being with the illusion of a body. Um, and Gnosticism has some of that kind of teaching as well. So um, Irenaeus spoke a lot about against that. Uh, he left Rome and travelled to Gaul in modern-day France and settled in Lugdunum, which is now modern-day Lyon. Uh, he lived amongst the Celts, or the Celts actually, uh, where he preached Jesus. Um, and for those of you who grew up reading um, 
Asterix and Obelix comics, um, Gaul and Lugdinium is the area around where um, Asterix and Obelix lived. So um, I got really excited when I heard that. Uh, as a result of Irenaeus's ministry, many Celts were converted, and um, so around 177 AD, Irenaeus was chosen to be the Bishop of Lyon. Uh, he wrote many letters and sermons, but only two of those remain. Um, one was the demonstration of apostolic preaching, and that was a summary of Christianity drawn from Scripture. His most famous work against the heresies, and that was five books refuting the false teachings of Valentinus, Marcion, and others. Um, you know, like I said, there was so much, because Christianity was a new religion, uh, it was very easy for people um, who maybe had an agenda, an axe to grind, or people even just were ignorant to just make up doctrines. Um, and, uh, you know, it appears that, that all of these people were able to, um, to garner, you know, many, many followers. Um, and so uh, Irenaeus felt it was necessary to write um, against the heresies um, to, to point out uh, and to refute all of these false doctrines. Now, in Against the Heresies, uh, uh, heresy, sorry, Irenaeus quotes from every New Testament book except 3 John. So again, like Polycarp, it's an important book to show that the, um, the early church accepted the New Testament scripture and that they were genuine and, and really were what they said they were. Um, his work would go on to shape the Christian understanding of scripture, um, the biblical canon and the church, and he was martyred in 200 AD. Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was born around 100 AD in Samaria. Um, he was a Greek, but he self-identified as Sumerian. So this whole thing about self-identification um, isn't a modern concept that appears. Um, before he became a believer, he was a well-known philosopher. Um, and after his conversion, he continued to wear his philosopher's robes, arguing that Christianity was a true philosophy. Now, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, Greek uh, culture was really, really well known for their philosophy. Um, and a lot of their, their philosophical um, styles and beliefs actually, um, you know, permeate um, our Western society to this day, like we, the way that that um, that that we Westerners think um, and reason, things like that, come from the whole Greek philosophy style. Um, you know, there is a there is a, um, a saying when I when I was in um, uh, in, in at C three, um, I was asked to join a, a missions um, group, uh, like a, it was a. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but but essentially, you were learning about being a missionary, and I had like I wasn't interested in being a missionary at all. Um, but my pastor had said, "Look, I really think this would be really helpful for you." So, um, and you had to pay to do the course, and, and I didn't want to pay to do the course because I didn't want to do the course. Um, but he said, "Look, how about you become the the course um, administrator?" Um, and, you know, you can do the course for free. Uh, and my role as course administrator was to, you know, boil a tea and coffee, set up the room, blah, blah, blah. So it wasn't a huge job. But anyway, um, the um, uh, one of the things we learned is, because uh, a lot of the ministry was around um, sort of the Asian region, and one of the things we learned was about um, the Asian mindset. And I'd never had any concept of the fact that that a different culture and different people group would actually have different mindsets and way that they think and the way that they reason. And what I learned is that there is a particular thing called the Asian mindset, but there's also a thing called the Western mindset. And our Western mindset, um, everything is formed by these very early Greek philosophies and all that kind of stuff, like Stoicism and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, so a philosopher in, in Greek culture was, was viewed very highly, you know, they were, they were the upper echelons of society. Um, so for Justin Martyr to convert um, from being a philosopher into a believer was quite amazing. But what he did, though, is that he, he used his philosopher's brain, his philosopher's understanding, and his philosopher's position to then go and preach the gospel. And the amazing thing about that, um, which I think has been lost in a lot of people, um, is he, he used this Greek um, reasoning um, to actually valid uh, validate validate sorry um, you know um, his beliefs and scripture in particular um, now during his time Christianity was actually outlawed so remember um, still at this time uh, Rome was the, the the dominant culture so you know all of these regions that these these early church fathers were living in were, were um, under Roman control and various Roman um, leaders would either tolerate Christians or persecute them um, you know the the, the Roman. Uh, you know, if you you were the emperor, you were a god. So it was required of the Roman citizens to actually uh, worship 
the the the, the emperor as a god. Um, and then when Christians refused, the emperor would then see that um, as reason to then persecute them or execute them. We saw that with Nero, didn't we? I think I spoke about Nero last time. Um, you know, where he persecuted all these Christians and burnt them at the stake, all that kind of stuff, and uh, sent them to the lions um, because they refused to bow down um, to the authority. You know, they that they. They're, 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 they had a greater authority in Jesus than they did with their, you know, with the with the um, the um, the Roman authorities. Um, anyway, so when when uh, Justin Martyr was around, uh, Christianity was an outlaw religion, um, but he realised that actually the reason why, or much of the persecution, resulted from a misunderstanding um, um, or because of false rumours of Christians. Um, so he was convinced that if if the Roman government knew the truth about Christians, then then they would stop the persecution. So he wrote uh, an apology. An apology is a defense of Christianity um, to um, Emperor Antonius Pius. And this letter, named First Apology, is considered to be one of the most valuable works of early Christianity. It outlines how to run church services, uh, how to do baptisms, and how to do communion. Um, and again, he quotes from more than 155 Bible verses from memory, almost verbatim from the Greek Septuagint in the Old Testament in the most of the cases. And this shows that his uh, knowledge of scripture was, was absolutely phenomenal. His second apology was written soon after Marcus Aurelius became emperor in 161 AD. This apology, Justin tried to show that the Christian faith alone was truly rational. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the, the, um, the great disservices that a lot of, um, you know, earnest believers um, have done throughout history is, uh, you know, thrown away rationality and logic um, and... You know, and and just you know accepted what they read at face value. I know I go on about that quite a lot, but it is a bit of a bugbear of mine. Um, you know that I think as believers we really need to be, um, need to view Christianity through a rational and logical lens. And there are things within Scripture, you know, that seem really strange. Um, things like talking snakes and talking donkeys, all that kind of stuff. And I, so I get, I get the 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 um, the the criticism that comes with Christianity. Look, I, you know, I, I can certainly explain both of those instances. Um, I won't go into that today. I can explain both of them in a rational and logical um, sense, but that's for another time. Um, so uh, he, his second apology was written soon after Marcus Aurelius becomes emperor in 161 AD. In this apology, apology, Justin tries to show that the Christian faith alone was truly rational, and I agree with him, there it is. He taught that the Logos, the Word, became flesh to teach mankind the truth of salvation. Um, and it's, it's like it's great to see because um, if you if you then go back and look at my uh, message on uh, history of the church, you'll see how so much of the gospel had just been twisted and um, you know molded into these man-made traditions. Um, so it was great to see one of the early church fathers trying to bring it back to to you know to reality to rationality. Um, Justin was martyred in 165 AD, and that's where he was given the name Justin Martyr. It's interesting the other guys weren't given the surname Martyr as well because um, they were all martyred. Okay, so the next group of an- of um, early church fathers were the anti Nicene fathers. Now, when Constantine proclaimed the Edict of Milan. Uh, meaning that religious toleration uh, was allowed in the 13, 313 AD, the persecution of Christians came to an end. Uh, and if you remember your story of Constantine, um, you know he was the emperor, uh, the Roman emperor. So, so Rome uh, at that stage sort of split into two two groups. You had the um, the eastern side and the western side. So Rome was the the seat of the western side. Constantinople was the side of the side of the eastern side. The western side lost power and became weaker and weaker and weaker, whereas the eastern side became stronger and stronger and stronger. So Constantine uh, moved the capital uh, for the Roman Empire into Constantinople, uh, which is now modern-day um, Istanbul. Um, or by, It was actually Byzantium before then too. Um, he named Byzantium after himself, Constantinople. Um, but there was a lot, of, um, a lot of persecution of Christians going on. He, um, A lot of people think that he... Um, was granting just Christians um, uh, the right to practice their religion. He actually granted all religions the right to practice their religion. So he didn't single out Christianity in that sense. Basically, this um, re- uh, 
the Religious Toleration Act um, or, or, or thing that he passed was for all religions to allow them to to uh, to be able to worship freely. But it, it was great for the Christians because previous up to that point they had all been persecuted uh, by different other other different emperors. So it meant that they could worship freely. Uh, he did also become a believer. If you remember um, your stories of Constantine, um, he had this vision um, of a cross and um, before a battle, and he won that battle and saw that as being. Um, you know, from God, and that's where the, the, the cross on the on all the shields comes from. Um, so Constantine convened the first ever ecumenical council in the city of Nicaea in modern-day Turkey in 325 AD. You might have heard of the Council of Nicaea. They had a few councils there in Nicaea. And the bishops and church leaders throughout the Roman Empire came along uh, to Nicaea and met to formally establish church doctrine, specifically to address the uh, Arianism, Ar- 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 sorry, Arianism um, beliefs that had sort of permeated the church as well. Uh, they believed that Jesus was created by God, um, that he wasn't eternal or one with God. Um, this meeting became known as the First Council of Nicaea, and this council formed a statement of faith that came became known as the Nicaean Creed. Um, now, if, if any of you guys ever grew up in the Anglican Church in particular, we used to recite the Nicaean Creed and the Apostles' Creed, which the Nicaean Creed came from um, all of the time. Um, I used to be able to recite it from memory, but I can't quite remember it now. Um, the Council of Nicaea established and settled the doctrines of the Trinity and Christ divinity in full humanity. Um, up until that point, the whole idea of the Trinity, as we saw, um, was sort of skew if. Um, Arianism was to, and other religions as well were teaching that um, Jesus wasn't divine um, and that he didn't come in, in flesh. So Docetism, if you remember, uh, taught that, um, that when Jesus walked the earth, it was actually a spirit and not, not his fleshly body at all. So the Church Fathers, um, between the Apostolic Fathers um, and this council, became known as the Anti-Nicene, and Anti means before, so the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Uh, one of the first uh, Anti-Nicene Fathers was Origen of Alexandria, and I'm sure you've heard of Origen before. He's quite a well-known character in, in Christianity, um, and he's been given um, precedence as one of the... the uh, most influential church fathers, and I believe he was given that precedence um, quite wrongly, to be honest, as we'll see in a second. Uh, Origen was born in 85 AD in Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, if you remember in that time, um, Egypt was still a part of the sort of Greek-Roman uh, Empire. Um, being uh, Egypt was um, invaded by Alexander in, I think, 350 BC or something like that. Um, and Alexandria was actually named after him, Alexander. And I think he actually died there too. Uh, Origen was one of the most important Christian scholars in the early church. Uh, he's remembered for his many scholarly works and writings, as well as his fanatical commitment to purity. He, um, he believed in extreme forms of, of piousness. So he would wear uh, you know, really uncomfortable woolen shirts, wooden uh, clothing, wooden wear sandals, would only eat sort of basically bread and water, would never you know, allow himself to indulge in any, any fun or anything like that. Uh, he began teaching at an early age, and he was so talented that he actually ran his in, a school on his own um, by the time he was in his early 20s. He was such a prolific teacher um, that at some point it said he had seven scribes writing his works at top speed. Uh, one of the important things to understand is that, um, and this is even true of a lot of the um, the um, apostles um, and uh, disciples, is that they never actually wrote their own things. They actually had scribes writing them down. Um, you know, Paul in particular, if you, look, if you pay attention to a lot of Paul's letters, um, you know, he will at the end say, I'm writing this in my own hand. Um, so he would have taken basically the, 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 um, the pen or the scroll, whatever they were writing on, off the scribe and actually written it on the parchment in his own hands. Uh, but generally, the, um, uh, everything they wrote or everything that was written down was actually recited or, or spoken by the person Then it was written down by the scribes. And that's how Origen operated. His most important works, De Principis, Principius, which means On First Principles, is believed to have been Christianity's first comprehensive work of systemic theology. And systemic theology means uh, organising the Bible into categorical systems, such as all the biblical teaching on angels or fasting or other situations as well, other things, um, which, which actually makes, uh, makes it a lot easier to understand. We've spoken a lot about the way that the Bible set out with different books in different styles. Um, and again, Nerida will be speaking about that when she starts talking about Job. Um, but um, you know, when we start looking at systemic theology, uh, systematic theology, sorry, um, it helps us to be able to understand without having to sort of wade through all the other stuff as well. 
Another one of his important works is Hexapla, uh, which means sixfold. And that's one of the earliest examples of textual criticism and scholarly apologetics, um, as well as the first interlinear Bible. What he did is he had one column of Greek text, sorry, Hebrew text, um, in, in parallel with about four or five columns of various Greek translations. Um, and I find, um, you know, even today when, when we're reading scripture, it really helps us to go to the interlinear, uh, to read it in English and see what it also says in the Hebrew and the Greek to sort of try and get an understanding of what's going on. Um, his purpose in compiling the Hexapla was to counter Gnostic and Jewish attacks on Christianity. So we're seeing it still this Gnosticism is still coming into the church, you know, a couple of hundred years after um, Jesus' ministry. Um, so, you know, it was, was a really, really insidious thing going on. The, the, the interesting thing about Gnosticism is that it's so broad. You know, there's so many different types of beliefs that can be under that Gnosticism umbrella. Um, they have a few key teachings, though, um, um, and they're the ones that sort of really um, do cause issues because a lot, of, a lot of Gnosticism actually has a Christian veneer. And if you're not careful, you can actually get caught up in this whole Gnosticism without even realising that's what you're doing. And I know a couple of... Uh, I've got one friend, a great friend of mine, um, whose uh, who's, um, grandfather was a uh, Pentecostal minister. And he has really, really extreme Gnostic beliefs, this guy. Uh, and we have some great discussions. I, I, he's living in America now, so we, we don't talk at all. But um, we used to have great... Um, um, discussions about um, Christianity, about those kind of things. And he was always coming from the Gnostic side. Um, so it was really interesting talking to him to see, you know, see how how close Gnosticism was in some respects to Christianity, but also I was then able to counter and sort of say, no, it's not like that way, it's, it's this way. And like he, I, I'm hoping he learned a lot from me. Um, I certainly learned a lot from him. Um, so Origin, as I said, um, Oh, here we go. This is really interesting. Uh, one of the ironic things about um, Origen is that he also believed um, a number of Gnostic ideas regarding Jesus and the Bible. Um, so he shunned the material world, as we saw before. He didn't like to indulge in any kind of thing, that any pleasure at all. Um, he viewed the world much the same way as the Gnostics, um, who believed that the material world was evil and only the spiritual world was holy. Um, he also believed in the pre-existence of souls and that a person's status was proportional to their commitment to God in their pre-existence. Um, his views on the Trinity were also unorthodox. He believed that the Trinity was a ranking, not an equality, uh, and he believed that everyone, even demons, would one day be forgiven and purified by God. He also believed that Scripture was mostly allegorical and that some of the events actually didn't take place um, uh, and were not based on real events at all. Um, now, we've got to be careful because that is true in some respects. You know, some events are written as, um, you know, as if they are real, but they're allegorical. I, mean, I think a, a classic example would be, um, you know, when Jesus is talking about Lazarus in, in heaven, um, you know, he's recounting a, you know, uh, using that as an allegory, um, but, but a lot of people have believed actually that is the model of heaven and hell because Jesus was speaking like that. So, you know, we've got to be really careful when we're reading Scripture that sometimes we are actually reading... Um, something allegorical, um, you know. But, but um, you know, Origen believed that the majority of Scripture was allegorical. Um, so, you know, um, what, what's interesting, you know, as I said before, he's viewed by, um, or he's viewed by many scholars and, and a lot of the early church fathers actually has been a heretic, but he was, um, you know, he's viewed by a lot of modern theologians as being really influential and a great influence and a great model for, um, you know, as a church father. So, you know, it's quite, quite, quite bizarre. It, it boggles my mind. Uh, as I said, he lived in extreme ascetism uh, without shoes or even a bed, so he'd sleep on the floor. Um, sometime after 251 AD, a plague swept through Rome and Emperor Decius laid the blame for it on the Christians who didn't worship him as a divine being. And so he began the extermination of the, the Christians, and I was speaking about that before. This became known as a Decian persecution. Um, during this, Origen was imprisoned and he was tortured, but he wasn't actually killed, which is kind of interesting. He wasn't he wasn't uh, martyred or crucified. Uh, he was released after Decius died, but died soon himself after from the injuries he received during his imprisonment. And like I said, despite his heretical views, Origen is viewed as one of the most important figures in the early church. And I guess in some respects he can because he, you know, his writings were, um, in particular, his writings against um, Gnosticism are really helpful. But yeah, um, you know, I think you've got to be careful if you, if someone starts to, to cite Origen as being one of their their heroes in the faith, then you sort of got to kind of wonder <laughs> where they're coming from. Tertullian, I spoke about him a little bit before. 
Uh, Tertullian was born in Carthage in North Africa around 150 AD. He was an apologist, theologian, and a moralist. Uh, like the other church fathers, he wrote extensively against heresies and Gnosticism. Um, he also wrote about everyday issues concerning believers, such as dressing modestly, marriage and remarriage, the arts, idolatry, and repentance. And his works outline many of Christianity's central doctrines at their earliest development. So his writings were really, really helpful in that respect. Um, he wrote of the Trinity as three persons in one, the fully divine and fully human nature of Jesus, the fall of man and original sin, and the virgin birth of, G- of Jesus. Um, and his writings and teachings uh, had a direct impact on many later church fathers, including uh, a young man by the name of Augustine, who we'll talk about later. He was also known as the first of the Latin fathers because he wrote exclusively in Latin. All right, the next bunch of um, church fathers were the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers, or another word for them as name for them as Latin fathers, and they came after uh, the period, um, either during or after the period um, of the Council of Nicaea. So they became known as the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers. Eusebius of Caesarea. Um, now, if you know your church history, this is a name you'll recognise straight away. Um, he was born around 260 AD in Palestine, and he's known as the father of church history. Eusebius was influenced by Pamphilus, who was a student of Origen, um, and Eusebius had access to many of Origen's writings, from which he learned a great deal about scripture. Uh, in th- 313 AD, Eusebius was made bishop of Caesarea. It's interesting they're all made bishops, isn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, bishop was, um, uh, you know, would be the head of the churches in that whole area. So they were all placed in fairly high positions. Um, he was sympathetic to the Arian position regarding Jesus. And remember, that was which states that Jesus um, was the son of God, that he was created by God, didn't always exist, and he was, he was subordinate to his father. Cebius wrote several major works in preparation of the gospel, and that was 15 books that refutes paganism. Again, we're seeing this whole thing about paganism and Gnosticism uh, infiltrating the church. Um, you know, it seems to be everywhere. Uh, in Demonstration of the Bible, that was 20 books that examined how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies, and that was really important. Uh, one of the most important books ever written on that subject. Uh, and his most famous was his Ecclesiastical History, and that's 10 books that provides a history of the church from the apostolic times to the death of Constantine. And any um, any pastor, leader, preacher worthy salt will have a copy of the Ecclesiastical History in their library somewhere. Now, I don't, um, only because I don't have a library. It's all online. Um, but in, in the time before um, you know, we had access to these electronic things, um, you know, it would have been one of the books you would have in your library. Uh, this book recorded the succession of bishops and teachers, such as the Apostles, Paul, Polycarp, Ignatius, and Arrhenius. Highlights a battle against heresy in the church and gives details regarding the biblical canon. Um, so, you know, we saw with some of the previous um, church fathers that the, the New Testament canon in particular, the Old Testament canon had already been pretty much established. Um, there were some older, um, older books and there are different books that are no longer in the Old Testament um, that were sort of taken out by other councils around this time. But the New Testament was um, essentially what it was today. There were a couple of other um, extra books in there um, that uh, were viewed as um, not being canonical. Some viewed they thought they were. Some books that are in our Bible today that that, um, at that stage weren't um, believed to be, um, you know, um, worthy of being in the canon. Um, But we can see by this early age that, um, you know, that that we could trust that what's in, in our modern um, Bibles was pretty much what they were reading back then too. Um, so the uh, the only books that weren't accepted um, around that time, around certainly around Eusebius's time, was uh, James, Hebrews, two Peter, two and three John, and Revelation. And coincidentally, those um, those books there that weren't part of the biblical canon were all um, what are known as the the um, the Jewish epistles or the Hebrew epistles. So uh, it's kind of interesting that that it took the church a long time to include those those um, those books there. Um, okay, Ambrose of Milan. Um, so he was born in 339 AD. Uh, he was born shortly after the First Council of Nicaea, and he was born into a wealthy and uh, influential Roman family. Um, he's an interesting guy. This one. He was he was governor of northern Italian provinces, and at one point was settled uh, was summoned to settle a conflict between rival religious factions. So the Orthodox Catholics and the Arians. Here again, the Arians um, rear their ugly heads. <laughs> 
Um, his actions in quelling the conflict saw him being asked to become Bishop of Milan, an offer that he took up. It's interesting that he was, um, you know, you would assume that he was a believer, um, but it's interesting that, that he was um, given the bishopry of Milan um, without having sort of been a teacher, I guess. Um, because of his political background, he taught that the church was not morally subject to the ruling government, but that the government was subject to the moral authority of the church. Actually, that's a really kind of interesting um, uh, paradox there because, you know, as we've seen throughout history and, and as we kind of are seeing in a lot of countries around the world today, you know, the, the government sees themselves as being the ultimate authority. Um, and, and, you know, if you are a part of government like um, Ambrose was, um, you know, you would think that they would believe the same thing and that the, that the, the government would have um, moral authority over the church. But he's actually gone the opposite direction there. And he's actually said that the church has moral authority over the government. Um which, uh, you know, look, <clears throat> is a double-edged sword. Certainly, you know, you don't want the government to be dictating what you can and can't do in church and who you can and can't have in church. Um, and, uh, you know, but at the same time, you don't want the the the, the church to become the government um, authority. And we've seen, you know, the, the results of that in, in a lot of Catholicism throughout the centuries as well. Not saying that, that modern Catholicism is like that at all, but certainly, you know, um, throughout the last, you know, f uh, from, say, the, the second century up until maybe the um, the 19th century or the 18th century, we saw that the, the, the Catholic Church, um, you know, ruled governments and ruled countries and, and to their detriment. Uh, you know, we look at things like the, the Spanish Inquisition and all of those other kind of um, pogroms where the church actually, you know, executed thousands and thousands of people. So, you know, anyway, so Ambrose was the, the first one that started that. He wrote the first known book on Christian ethics, and that was called On the Duties of the Church's Servants. Uh, he's also credited with introducing the concept of congregational singing, uh, which at the time was really controversial. Uh, we'll see another church father that actually didn't like that at all. Um, he apparently was an excellent preacher, um, and one of his sayings has actually entered our modern jargon, that was, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. He emphasised the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and taught on Christians having a personal, personal faith. That was kind of revolutionary at that stage, you know. It, it, um, that's the way that Christianity started out, but as, as time progressed, it sort of became more like a state religion and something you had to do, you know. Um, as, as the church grew more powerful in, in the political realm, uh, the less power a, a person had to choose whether to believe or not. So it was really revolutionary what Ambrose taught there. Now, his teaching attracted a young believer named Augustine, who was actually um, baptised by Ambrose. Um, but Augustine would far surpass, surpass Ambrose, however, in the history of the church. So who was Augustine? I'm sure we've all heard of Augustine of Hippo. Um, he's probably one of the most influential, or at least one of the most, most well-known um, early church fathers. Uh, he was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, and he was born in 354 AD. Um, before his conversion, he studied under the Persian philosopher Mani, who taught dualism, and that's a Gnostic belief um, in the division between good which is the spiritual realm, and evil, which is the natural realm. Um, and Origen sort of believed in that dualism as well, as we saw. Uh, Augustine taught that in the Old Testament, the law was written um, on tablets uh, outside of us. It was written outside of us on tablets, and the law could not justify mankind. Whereas in the New Testament, the law was written inside of us, and that we are made righteous through God's grace and love. And that sounds great, until you read the next line. He believed that Christ's grace does not cover our sin, but instead it aids us in helping us keep the law. Uh, like Origen, Augustine believed that scripture was mostly allegorical. He was one of the most prolific Latin authors in terms of surviving works, and his surviving works number in the hundreds. Um, he's best known, however, for his uh, writings uh, called The Confessions, which is a personal account of his early life uh, before he became a believer. So he was a, um, what would you say, in modern parlance, uh, the young people we use the word player. So he used to, you know, sleep around a lot. Um, was into a lot of the vices. Um, I think he'd been married a couple of times, had children, all that kind of stuff. He became a believer. Um, put all that aside. So that's so he wrote about that in his confessions. Um, and then he wrote the City of God, which is an allegorical story of the conflict between the pagan world and the Christian world. Um, and his teaching heavily influenced Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, and John Calvin. Uh, 
Um, he also influenced much of the Catholic Church's doctrines, including on infant baptism, the perpetual virginity of Mary, and the real presence of Jesus' blood and body in communion. Um, there is a word for that. I can't remember what it is. Um, Transubstitution, I think it is. Um, so there's a belief in the Catholic Church that when you you know that when the priest prays over the the wafer and and the grape juice or whatever they're drinking, um, that actually physically turns into the body and blood of Jesus. Next uh, Nicene father or post Nicene father was Jerome. He was born in 345 AD and in Dalmatia, uh, which is around about modern day Croatia. Uh, Jerome is considered one of the early church fathers for his work translating the Hebrew and Greek scriptures into Latin, and his work became known as the Latin Vulgate. Now, you've probably heard of the Latin Vulgate. You know, when you read particularly um, the, the King James or the New King James Version, you'll always see those little LXX and things like that down the bottom. Um, those little footnotes actually saying, I think the LXX is the Latin Vulgate. Uh, no, that might be Septuagint. Anyway, uh, it does mention the Latin Vulgate uh, quite a lot, and he's responsible for the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate. Um, he was criticised by people like Augustine because many words in the Hebrew had no Latin equivalent. So Jerome had translated uh, what's called thought for thought rather than word for word. And this process is known as dynamic equivalence. And actually that's quite a good way to, to translate scripture because particularly in the English, a lot of uh, words in, in the English um, have several different meanings in the Greek or the Hebrew. And as we've spoken many times, um, the translators, when they're translating scripture, uh, will use their own understanding of, of that word and then translate that accordingly. Um, but when you are sort of um, looking at it in the context of the whole scripture and, and what's around it, things like that, um, then you know, you're able to get a better understanding of what's going on. So in a lot of respects, this thought for thought or the dynamic equivalence um, way of translating scripture works a lot better than just word for word. Um yeah, as he, he defended it by saying that while the words may differ, the meaning did not. <clears throat> he used the example of many of the passages in the New Testament that quote from the Old Testament loosely or incompletely. And we've seen that many times, haven't we? Jesus used, um, you know, quoted from the Old Testament and, you know, was worded completely different to what you see in the Septuagint or in the Hebrew. Uh, it was more like, you know, um, for those of you in Australia who have ever seen the movie The Castle, um, it was more the vibe than the actual, you know, uh, written words. And that's sort of um, what Jerome was saying with his um, Latin Vulgate. All right, what about other influential figures? So after the 5th century, the age of the Church Fathers ended. Um, the Church entered an era of false doctrine, state-ordained churches, and idolatry. And again, if you go back to my message on um, history of the Church, um, you'll see um, how... Many of these false doctrines and 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 uh, particularly idolatry. I was saying before about you know how a lot of these early church fathers were actually um, venerated as saints, and people would actually you know go into churches. Um, that there is a story. I think it's it might be after, actually, even actually Jerome, one of the the later church fathers. Um, they somehow got a hold of his arm after he died. I think someone had actually um, like you know. Um, unburied his body, what's the word, disinterred his body and, and cut his arm off. And then they've actually got his arm in like this glass tube on a statue. Um, and it's, you know, it's called a, a holy relic. And people actually go and, and actually kneel down and pray in front of that statue. And these, these whole things about relics and stuff like that um, actually um, started pretty early in the church, only, you know, 150 or so years after Jesus walked the earth. Um, and so, so um, you know, once... A lot of these church fathers died away and their, their teaching sort of fizzled away. Um, you know, it was a free-for-all in, in the church and a lot of uh, really, really bad doctrines and heresies and stuff came in. Um, and so that was why in 1517 Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg in Germany. And this is, of course, as we know, where the, the Protestant movement sprang out. Now, that doesn't mean that, that uh, Martin Luther was a good guy. Martin Luther wasn't a good guy. Um, you know, we know that, that Martin Luther was an extreme anti-Semitic um, and, uh, you know, he, he taught a lot about against um, uh, the Jews because they believed that the Jews were responsible for Jesus' death. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't grasp that actually it was the, um, you know, it was the, the, the Jewish leadership, um, you know, self-righteousness, all that kind of stuff that was responsible. Um, you know, so they blame individual Jews for it. The other thing that, that uh, Luther did is that he believed that, um, you know, Ordinary people weren't able to weren't allowed to read the Bible, and, and actually he um, executed people for doing that. So he wasn't a good guy. 
Um, but anyway, so from him, the Protestant movement sprang up. Uh, his main belief was, was that the church had to go back to the Bible, and he was true in that sense. You know, the Bible, the Bible was, you know, the the, the proper authority. Um, and other uh, other theologians around this time also agreed. Um, so among them were John Wycliffe, whose name you might know. Um, he taught against the authority of the Catholic Church. Uh, John Tyndale, another name that you'll be familiar with, who translated the Bible into English, and a young French theologian named John Calvin. All right, so who was John Calvin? He's a, a name that I'm sure we've all heard before, and and um, you know certainly his his name or his style of of belief is still quite. Uh, prevalent in the church today. He was born in Picardy, France in 1509. Not many of you know that he was a Frenchman. Um, He was Martin Luther's successor as the preeminent Protestant theologian in 16th century Christendom. He lived in Geneva, Switzerland for a brief time, but was forced into exile by anti-Protestant authorities. Interesting thing, he was invited back and after a few years became an important religious and political figure. He actually established a religious government in Geneva and there was made supreme leader in Geneva in 1555. And his government instituted many positive policies, but they also punished impiety and dissent against Calvin's teachings. In the first five years of his rule in Geneva, 58 people were executed and 76 were exiled for their religious beliefs. So here's a, here's a guy that's considered to be this, this amazing theologian um, who's actually executing people for not agreeing with his theology. Um, you know, so this whole veneration that we have of these early church fathers, you know, I think is, you know, nine times out of ten, really, really misplaced. We've got to be very careful when we start to venerate people um, because the majority of them have, the majority of them have um, you know, very questionable pasts. That's not to say, though, you know, if you've had a questionable past and you've, you've stopped it, you've, you've um, repented of doing all that kind of stuff, you know, you've turned your back, you've turned away from it, which is what repent means, and you're no longer doing it, you know, um, you know, Jesus taught about forgiving people, and and you know, we know we've had people in our church that that um, you know were, were criminals, um, lived bad lives, um, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, and and repented of their old ways, and you know, so we can't hold them to account for the things that they've done. But there's no evidence that John Calvin ever repented um, of or apologized or asked forgiveness for executing all these people who didn't believe what he believed. Um, he allowed no art other than music, and that music could not allow instruments. Under his rule, Geneva became the centre of Protestantism. They sent out missionaries to the rest of Europe, creating the Presbyterianism in Scotland, the Puritan movement in England that eventually left England and founded the American colonies due to the persecution they were receiving in England, and the Reformed Church in the Netherlands. Now, um, Presbyterianism is still uh, around to this day, uh, particularly in, in the UK. Um, you know, I think it's been renamed here into... The Uniting Church, I think here. Yeah, I think the Uniting, I think the Presbyterians and the Methodists um, combined and they become the Uniting Church. Um, but that teaching is still prevalent in in those churches. Um, the fact that Calvin is viewed as one of the church's great leaders, in my mind, is astounding. It really perplexes me that people can view him as being such a great figure uh, when you see what he did in the past. Um, and I'd say the majority of the reason why people do um, venerate him is purely because they haven't bothered to study his life and what he's done. Uh, His most famous work is the Institutes that he wrote in 1560. Um, The Institutes are considered to be some of the most important doctrinal works in church history, but as we're going to see in a second, uh, this characterisation, I think, is unfounded. Now, another influential figure around the same time was a guy called Jacobus Arminius, and you may have heard of him. Uh, He was born in 1560 in the Netherlands, um, he was orphaned at a young age and was adopted by a Protestant priest who was an admirer of Calvin's teachings. Uh, Arminius attended university where he was influenced by not only Calvin's teachings but by Lutheran teaching, Zwinglian and Anabaptist views. Now, Zwinglian um, is the belief that the Bible is the inspired word of God and has a much higher authority than human sources such as ecumenical councils and even the church fathers. And I would agree with that. Actually, it's interesting. Um, uh, in one of our messages, we talked about... Um, Oh, I think it might have again been the church history. Um, anyway, talking about um, after the temple was destroyed in AD seventy in Jerusalem, that um, the they were no longer able to the Jews were no longer able to do their sacrifices and things like that, and this was this was they that then started the the age of the um, the rabbinical age they call it, um, and and then after that 
the the writings of the Old Testament uh, were then viewed as being less authoritative and less important as the rabbinical writings. Um, and the same thing sort of started to happen within the Christian church. More and more, the writings of some of the early church fathers and a lot of those theologians started to be viewed as more, being more important and more authoritative than Scripture. So Swinglianism uh, actually rejected that and believed that um, you know all these councils and 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 the writings of the church fathers um, didn't hold as much sway as Scripture, which look you know is the right right thing I believe. Um, it did though recognize the human element in the inspiration, and that's really important to understand. You know, Scripture um, most definitely um, is God breathed, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't written by God. We've got to understand that. You know, like the um, the humanity of the writers of the writers comes out in every single word they wrote. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't take control of the the author's hand and you know and cause them to write, and and the author had no idea what was going on. That's called automatic writing. It's like a spiritualist kind of phenomenon. Um, you know, the Bible wasn't written that way at all. It was inspired by God, um, and the, um, the the author's humanity got in the way, so their understanding of the true nature and character of God got in the way. We've spoken about this many times. Um, you know, so that's why we've got to be really careful when we're reading Scripture, that we're understanding that we're reading a book inspired by God but written by man. Now, that's not to take away the, um, the, the spiritual aspects of it. Like, I'm really, I'm into the whole, metaphysical physical is not the right word, but the whole spiritual, uh, spirituality behind the Bible, and I, I really love the idea of, of um, um, you know, the importance of numbers in Scripture um, and equidistant letter sequencing, all that kind of stuff, and and, and seeing how, you know, uh, using numbers and things like that, how um, we can see that there is actually a divine, uh, a divine, something divine going on behind the actual written words in the Hebrew and the Greek, of course, not the... Um, not the English translations. Um, so I'm not taking away the divinity of the Bible at all, but we just need to understand that when we're reading Scripture that we're reading something that was written um, through the mindset of the person writing at that particular time. Uh, Zwinglianism also rejected the Catholic view that the bread and wine in communion literally becomes the actual body and blood of Jesus. So again, I'd say that you know Zwinglianism um, sort of more suits um, you know the style of beliefs that we have nowadays in the Pentecostal movement. After graduating from university, Arminius began teaching as a lay preacher, then was ordained in 1588. He had a reputation as a good preacher and a faithful pastor, a bit like myself. Um, he garnered controversy when he began to teach on Romans 7. Uh, he taught that man, through grace and being born again, was no longer in bondage to sin. And this teaching was met with a lot of resistance by the church because it contradicted, contradicted Calvinist teaching, and we'll have a look at that in a second. Um, his teaching on justification by faith was also controversial and it led to much conflict. Um, and his views against Calvinism eventually led his doctrine being labelled Arminianism. Now, Arminianism didn't fully develop until after um, uh, Arminius died. His followers became known as a remonstrance after they issued a document containing five points of uh, difference from the mainstream Calvinism. Um, and these uh, five points became known as the five articles of the remonstrance. Uh, but the Calvinists condemned Arminius' theology and persecuted Arminian pastors. Uh, again, uh, you know, Calvin was seen as this great church leader, and look, he's persecuting people that didn't believe in his doctrines. Arminianism remained, however, and essentially, or eventually, influenced both John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist movement. Okay, so we can see that there was conflict between Calvinism and Arminianism. So what I'm going to do just briefly, just sort of go through a chart that's going to, going to show you um, the differences between the two. Um, now, who's heard of the um, the Calvinism um, doctrine uh, using the acronym TULIP? Um, TULIP stands for total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Now, a gentleman by the name of Dennis Bratcher has created this table that I reckon effectively compares the two. So the T, the total depravity, according to Calvin, human beings are so affected by the negative consequences of original sin that they are incapable of being righteous and are always and unchangeably sinful. Human freedom is totally enslaved by sin, so we can only choose evil. Whereas Arminianism, um, and these are pretty much um, been um, uh, written by John Wesley or John Wesley's beliefs, but um, instead of total depravity, um, Wesley taught on deprivation, that human beings are sinful and without God, incapable or deprived on their own of being righteous. However, they are not irredeemably sinful and can be transformed by God's grace. 
God's prevenient grace, I don't know what that word means, but anyway, God's prevenient grace restores to humanity the freedom of will. Okay, the you in tulip. Unconditional election. Since human beings can only choose evil, God by his eternal decree has chosen or elected some to be counted as righteous, without any conditions being placed on that election. Whereas in Arminianism, it's conditional election. God has chosen that all humanity be righteous by his grace, yet has called us to respond to that grace by exercising our God-restored human freedom as a condition of fulfilling election. Okay, the L, limited atonement. The effects of the atonement by which God forgave sinful humanity are limited only to those whom he has chosen. Whereas in Arminianism, uh, we have unlimited atonement. The effects of the atonement are freely available to all those whom he has chosen, which includes all humanity, whosoever will. Now I'll speak about that in a second, by the way. I, irresistible grace, the grace that God extends to human beings to effect their election cannot be refused since it has been decreed by God. Whereas under Arminianism, it's resistible grace. God's grace is free and offered without merit. However, human beings have been granted freedom by God and can refuse his grace. And then the P in uh, Tulip, Perseverance of the Saints. Since God has decreed the elect and they cannot resist grace, they are unconditionally and eternally secure in that election. And under Arminianism, Assurance and Security. There is security in God's grace that allows assurance of salvation, but that security is in relation to continued faithfulness. We can still defiantly reject God. Now, if we were to compare the two there, um, you know, I would certainly say that, that um, us, um, you know, certainly me personally, um, and, uh, you know, broadly, um, you know, the, the Pentecostal movement uh, will be more influenced by the Arminian side of, of this debate rather than the Calvinist side. Um, there are still other denominations that are certainly influenced by the Calvinist side, and I know that many of the sort of mainstream um, Bible colleges and, and um, universities um, teach from a Calvinist point of view. There are things within Arminianism which I don't believe are correct, like the, um, uh, where was it? Um, God, uh, anyway, um, there was something in there that I, that I just, oh, that's right, it was um, uh, predestination. You know, I think predestination is one of the big things. We've spoken on predestination quite a few times, so I don't want to go into that today. Uh, but but uh, for all intents and purposes, um, both John Calvin and um, Arminian sort of believe that God chooses people uh, rather than people choosing him. Um, look, I mean, there is some elements within uh, Arminianism where it's like, yeah, we choose, but but it's it's kind of like there's a predestination element still involved. Um, whereas in uh, Calvinism, it's just purely, you know, God chooses you. Um, you have no choice in the matter, um, and that's it. So that means that that um, you know, like, so my neighbour across the road who's not a believer, um, you know, God has chosen for them to you know die without ever knowing Him. You know, um, whereas He's chosen me because I'm somehow more special than my neighbour across the road. But we know that Scripture tells us that um, there is no, um, you know, there's no favouritism. God has no favouritism. So, look, there are, there are certain elements of Arminianism which, which aren't quite what we, what we sort of believe nowadays, but certainly much, much more of a more freeing um, belief system what, the, what Calvinism is all about. Um, like I said, I don't believe that Arminianism is perfect, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I agree with what John Wesley said, actually, about Calvinism. Uh, Calvinism said that, um, you know, your God is my Satan. Um, you know, Wesley believed that Calvinism was a spiritual cancer, which deforms the image of God to such an extent that it makes him out to be a monster. And it certainly does, you know, like I said, you know, this idea that God chooses one person to be saved and another, another to, to, you know, to, to not, you know, is, you know, it's an abomination against the name of God, you know, it's, it's, turning him into something evil. Um, you know, I, I, look, I certainly wouldn't go up to someone who believes in Calvinism and say those kind of things. I think I think Wesley, uh, you know, used very, very strong language, and I certainly wouldn't use as th that language at all. But certainly I, I do agree with, with his seg uh, sentiments. I do agree that, that um, you know, that Calvinism um, places God into a uh, into this box that, that, that we know um, that God doesn't fit into. Uh, and much of this doctrine actually comes from the idea that God is in control of everything and everyone, um, and that God causes evil. Now, that's not a, that's not just um, solely, um, you know, um, 
a Calvinist thought. I mean, how often have you seen well-meaning believers sort of tell someone who's going through something, you know, God is in control? Um, you know, we watched a, um, a really, really interesting presentation on Friday um, from uh, a guy called Pat Masidi, um, who had a whole bunch of different uh, guests on, um, basically talking about what's going on in the country at the moment. Um, and and a lot of these well-meaning, uh, he had a whole bunch of different people on. He had um, believers, non-believers, had a Jewish guy on, uh, a, a Greek, orth- Greek Orthodox guy, uh, a couple of politicians, all that kind of stuff. Not, not all of them were believers, but what was interesting, though, is that how often the term God is in control came up in that that um, that presentation. Um, and it's like, well, if God is in control, then he's not doing a really good job, is he? Um, you know, so but we've talked about this many times. So I'm not going to go into de- too much detail about to that today. But, but um, you know, certainly um, there are parts of the institutes. I'm just going to read out a couple of bits and pieces from his inst- Calvin's institutes that sort of talk about that. Uh, section three of institutes, pages uh, 22 and 23. Um, Calvin says that God foreknew, or saw, but ordained or arranged the fall. So Calvin is saying that God didn't just foreknow what was going to happen in the fall, but He actually planned it. So basically, what he's saying is that that actually God, um, you know, was the one who who came up with the whole idea of, of the serpent in the garden, and actually made it so that Adam and Eve would fall, like you know, put all the pieces into place um, so that Adam and Eve would actually fall. Um, he believed that everything happens is um, you know good and bad is the will of God for your life. Um, look, he did get it right when he said that there's no difference between God causing and allowing it. Now we've got to understand that God allows things to happen. Um, but but not in the sense that we understand it. You know, he allows it to happen because what he's done is he's he's give, placed um you know um everything under our dominion on the earth, and he's also and also um, Satan is the god of this world. So, you know, God has seated down. He's placed everything um put everything in place for um uh you know what am I trying to say? So, he, okay, here's an example. So, God knew that Adam and Eve would fall, that mankind would fall. He didn't arrange it. He knew it was going to happen um, by virtue of the fact that he gave um, Adam free will. He allowed Adam and Eve to then go and do it. So that's what I mean when I say allow. Um, so Calvin's overall view, though, of God's nature and character is wrong. Um, so two quotes from the Institutes. Um, one of the quotes is, Because with the br- bridle of his power, God holds him, Satan, bound and restrained. He carries out only those things which have been permitted to him. So he obeys his creator whether he will or not, because he is compelled to yield him to service. So in other words, what he's saying is that Satan is, is uh, God's henchman, and Satan can only do what God tells him or allows him to do, um, and that Satan is an unwilling being, for want of a better word, um, that he's basically in the employ of God um, for a specific purpose of doing the evil things that God doesn't want to do himself. You know, God wants to keep his hands clean, much like a mafia don would. Um, so he sends his henchman out to do the dirty work. The other thing he said is the devil and the whole train of the ungodly are in all direction, all directions held by the hand of God as with a bridle, so that they can neither conceive any mischief nor plan what they have conceived, nor much soever that may have planned, move a single finger to perpetrate, unless as so far as he permits, nay, unless in so far as he commands that they are not only bound by his fetters, but are even forced to do his service. So again, that's that's two instances where basically Calvin is saying that the, the devil can only do or Satan can only do uh, what God commands him to do. Um, and and Nerid is going to speak about that a little bit within uh, the book of Job as well. There's a famous part of Job where, where you know, Satan supposedly asked permission by God to go and affect Job. So she's going to talk about that too. Uh, now, uh, John Piper, who's quite an influential uh, person in the church today, believes um, in these kind of things as well about God and about his nature and character. And we do see this belief everywhere within the body of Christ. Like I said before, how often have you seen someone going through something and someone says to them, don't worry, God is in control. Now, of course, that person um, is trying to make that other f- person feel better. You know, like it is a, you know, it's not like that person saying that um, to, to um, you know, to make them feel bad about things. Um, you know, their, their um, motivation would be to try and make that person feel better. But in reality, they are saying to that person, God's making you go through this for some reason. You know, God's making you go through the sickness because he needs you to learn something or or. God, God killed that baby on your womb um, because you're not praying enough. Or God did this because he, he, you know, he wants to teach you that. Or you should be going there. Blah blah blah. You know, I mean that that's that's an evil doctrine. You know, um, that's not the nature and character of God at all. Um, <clears throat> but that's what 
uh, Calvinism essentially um, is saying. But like I said before, Arminium also has an element of God being in control as well. So we can't necessarily say that all Arminium is as good. And look, you know, there are parts of, of Calvinism that's right, like a lot of his teaching and theology was correct. But, but you know, for the most part, his tulip, which is, is the... the um, condensation um, of all of his teaching, that certainly, in my mind, is not something that a believer should be following. So Calvin says that everything that happens is God's will and that the devil is God's devil and only does what God commands him to do. Whereas the Armenians say that God allows or gives permission for Satan to come and hurt you or make you suffer. And both of these views are distinctly Old Testament views of the nature and character of God. And we know, of course, that this is most definitely not the way that God operates. Um, I think... You know, Nerida and I have gone to great pains to try and explain what the true nature and character of God is. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully that's something that has sort of been, um, you know, is now part of your own belief and understanding. I know that certainly we have a lot of people that, that um, speak to us that have been in our church in the past that are no longer with us. Um, you know, people that can't come because they moved to different areas, things like that. And often we'll get messages from them saying, you know, like I heard this in my church today and, and immediately my spirit stood up and said, no, that's not right because that's not the way that God operates. And I'm really, really pleased to hear that kind of stuff because it means that even though we, you know, we sort of in some respects we are, um, you know, saying the same stuff over and over and over again, um, you know, at least it, it appears that it's, it's actually getting into some people's um, understanding. A little bit like that muscle memory. I think I spoke about muscle memory the other day when I play the guitar. Um, you know, I um, my fingers automatically go to the shape of the chords without me having to think about it because I've been that practice and doing it over and over again has created that muscle memory in my hand, and it's the same kind of thing. Um, you know, with with our beliefs. You know, once we when we start to understand the true nature and character of God, when we hear it over and over and over and over and over again, it becomes a muscle memory within us. So that as soon as we hear something that we, that, that we know not right, not is not right, we'll automatically know that that's not right because it doesn't line up with the true nature and character of God. So regardless of um, so much of our church history and doctrines being man-centred, hateful, ungodly, and doctrinally unsound, the modern church, thankfully, has been able to come to an amazing and life-changing entity that it is today. I'm so thankful that many of those who came before us heard from the Holy Spirit and were willing to put aside what was accepted doctrine and listen to the Spirit's leading. Of course, there is still a lot of bad doctrine in the church today. Um, I know that we've certainly sat under it. Um, you know, those of you listening today. Uh, but praise God, the modern church is still a far better place than what it was. Um, you know, it's a far better place spiritually and doctrinally than, uh, than those became before us. Um, but, you know, without those who came before us, the, without those who did the hard yards in, uh, you know, in, in uh, doctrine and teaching and things like that, we wouldn't be the church that is today. And certainly we wouldn't be, wouldn't be the believers that we are today um, without the work that the early church fathers did. Amen.